So let's begin. Let's read at uh, verse 13. So Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but resolve, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. If it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you'll help us to understand this passage and believe it. And since it's very applicable, it's very practical that we would apply it to our lives for your honor and your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Please be seated. So the, the passage is about what we called, what he called at the beginning of the chapter, doubtful things or debatable things or side issues or uh, Christian liberties or freedoms, things like that. You can call it any one of those things that you want to. Um, and we talked last time about how um, the church is very, uh, there's, there's a lot of issues that aren't clearly spelled out in the Bible that um, Christians can find themselves on opposite sides of as it relates to should you or shouldn't you, can I or can't I, uh, those types of things. And, um, and, and so we talked about the two sides. Now, I feel like the passage is extremely well balanced as it relates to both sides. But the way we divided it, uh, it probably felt heavy towards one side as opposed to the other. He makes up for that today. Um, as it relates to that. Um, he, he, there's the two sides as it relates to any of these questionable, uh, debatable, freedom uh, type of issues. There's, there's those who abstain from certain things and, and that's what they do. And the instruction um, as it relates to them was, their, their main instruction was, don't make a big deal about it. Don't argue about it. Don't debate over it. Don't get ugly towards somebody who doesn't do the same as you over it. That their main instruction was, we don't, we don't get in fights over these things. They really are side issues. That, that, um, that if you're somebody who feels like you need to abstain from certain things as a Christian, that as long as you do that without pushing that on other people and insisting that they do exactly the same thing as you, and you're not judging them or despising them because they have a different view on it than you, then, then you're doing the wrong thing. Or you're doing the right thing. As long as you're not pushing some sort of wrong-headed legalism on somebody else, but you truly feel like God has this for you, that this is something that you should be doing in your life or not doing, then, then that, that he really doesn't give a, a whole lot of other instruction to the people on that side of things. There's still some application for us in the rest of the passage, for a person on that side of things. 
uh, as it relates to the rest of the passage. But, but as it relates to that, that, that's the main issue. Don't fight over it. Don't judge. Don't despise people. And, and it's not that clear cut either because you can have one issue for yourself that you feel like this is something that is an absolute no, no for me as a Christian. And you, and, and you could be around a bunch of other people that are like, I have no problem doing that as a Christian. And then you could have something else that you're on the complete opposite side. It's not usually clear cut. There are legalistic people that are against everything. But as it relates to some of these uh, uh, debatable issues, these uh, Christian liberties, it's not always straight across the board. You have some and other people have others. And so, as, as we said, the first part of the chapter was heavy towards those people that have more of those abstaining types of things. That, that's their instruction. Don't fight with people over it. Don't, don't look down on people over it and, and that kind of thing. But for those who feel uh, more freedom to exercise certain liberties, um, the, the main focus is going to be on those people on this second half and how they're supposed to operate as it relates to that. Now, both sides were instructed heavily, don't be fighting over these things. Don't be looking down on each other. Don't think you're better than them. Don't think they're worse than you. Both sides were given that instruction. But there's another huge and huge important element for those that <coughs> want to exercise their Christian liberties that's uh, talked about in this half of the chapter. And so verse 13 again says, uh, and we looked at the first half of this verse last time. It says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And so Paul had said that uh, what he, he said, what he'd said at the beginning of verse 13 to, to firm up that idea of don't be judging about Christian liberties or, or restrictions on these side issues. And, but then he also at the end of the verse, he introduces the second half of the whole thing. This second part, the half of what do we do with these side issues, these Christian liberties. And, and, and so um, he said, um, on, as it relates to these debatable issues of personal Christian liberties in the Christian life, he says, let's resolve something. Let's make a firm decision about something. And that firm decision is, let's decide not right now, knowing that, that people don't always see things exactly the same on these side issues as Christians. Let's resolve at least this, that we're not going to put a stumbling block in a brother's way. In other words, so, okay, we, all, we can all agree. We've seen the first half of the chapter. We get, we get it. People don't see eye to eye on every issue in the Christian life. And again, this is it probably a good idea to remind us. This is not talking about the clear cut stuff. This isn't talking about who Jesus is and how to be saved. It's not talking about things that are clearly spelled out as it relates to sin. Because there are many issues of sin that are clearly spelled out that nobody should be debating at all. If you're debating, you're, you're arguing with God alone. And that's not a good position to be in. But there are those side issues that they're not clearly spelled out. And, and so he says, okay, so we can agree that those exist and, and that we have these freedoms or these restrictions depending on who we are and that we're not to argue over it, but we're not to look down on each other. And, but then he says, and while we're at it, let's be just as diligent. Okay, I'm not going to fight over it. Good. Okay, I'm not going to look down over it. Good. Let's be just as diligent to make sure that our stance on an issue does not stumble somebody else. And he introduces that and he doesn't explain it until further, a little bit further down. But, but, but right away he gives a little idea of what it means and he says, it's, what's a stumbling block? He says it's a, it's a cause to fall. Putting something in someone's way that's a cause to fall. And the reason why he uses that is because often the Christian life is likened to a walk. You know, it's our walk. How we walk is, is often how the Christian life is described. And so he says, he's basically saying that there, there can be an, you can, you can practice something, you can do an act, or you can have an attitude even that would lead someone else to trip up in their Christian life, in their walk. Here they are, they're trying to make progress in their relationship with God. And it's possible, he's saying, 
that you could do something in your freedom or in your attitude against the freedom, you could do something that would trip somebody up, that would make it so that their walk becomes not as good as it was. And, and so that's what he's going to elaborate on in the rest of the passage. But before he does, he, before he even says that, he says, let's just, from the start, isn't that what we would want to do? Is there a real Christian who says, I don't care if something I do offends or hurts or harms or stumbles or trips up another Christian? That's their problem. If you're a Christian, that should, be, should not be your attitude at all. It, it, it should be easy to go, yeah, I can, I can make that resolve. I can make that resolve. I, it is not my intention. It's not my desire. It's not my purpose or point in anything that I do and any of the freedoms that I exercise or anything like that. It is not my desire to trip somebody up. So here they are walking along. They have a great walk with the Lord and I stick my foot out in front of them and they hit their face on the ground. No Christian should want to do that. In fact, no Christian should not only not want to do that, but should more than that go, I want to do everything I can to make sure I don't do that, even if it's on accident. And so that's, that's, where, he's, that's where he's going to go with this whole thing. I, I don't want to stumble anyone. I don't want to, I'm, I'm going to go and make sure that I don't. I want, to res, I want to make that my resolve. Now, having made that resolve, the next question would be, okay, well, how do I do that, Right? Okay, I'm resolved. You, there might be some things that, and we're going to find out there is, that you're like, okay, I'm resolved, but you didn't realize that this thing that you're doing does trip somebody up. And, and so if you're going to make the resolve, you have to be like, okay, well, what's it going to take? What will it take to make sure I don't do that? And so uh, that's what he goes on to next. He says in verse 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, nothing is unclean. When he uses the word unclean there, um, his, he's, uh, he probably has in mind the idea of the Old Testament uh, ceremonial laws, which were uh, designed to uh, make some, make the peop, help the people to understand the holiness of God. But also, it, it was strict for the nation of Israel. They were under the law. And it says, and the idea is that there, are, there were certain things that would keep the people of Israel from being able to draw near to God. If they were ceremonially, uncle, ceremonially unclean, I always have a hard time with that word, then they couldn't go to worship in the temple. They couldn't go close. The temple was a place where they drew close to God. And it represented that there are things that people can do that make it so that their approach to God or their relationship with God or their ability to go into worship is hindered. It, in other words, in the, in the system under the law, there were things that they could, weren't supposed to do. And because if they did, it would hinder their relationship, their fellowship with God, their fellowship with God. And, and so that's the idea. That's what unclean has to do with. And now here the Apostle Paul says, I know there is nothing, nothing in itself that can do that. And, and, and I know that. And he says, I know that from the Lord. Now, how does he say that? Well, he says that based on all of uh, chapter three through eight, that we're saved by grace, that our relationship with God is by faith alone in Jesus, through gra or grace alone, through faith alone. And that because of that, there's nothing unclean. There's nothing that, that could make it so that I can't have a good, close walk with the Lord. There's nothing in itself. So one in, you know, the different examples that were given, you know, the eating and the drinking of things or the partake or the being involved with certain things. There's nothing in itself. If I have real faith, that's how that's how powerful it is that our salvation is through faith. We trust Jesus. We have a relationship with God by that alone. And so there's nothing that can make that wrong. If I went and did something that somebody else said, oh, I don't think you should do that. No, nothing in itself. That's not, again, a side issue. We've got to keep that context. It's not the things that are clearly spelled out. 
And he says, and I know that. I know that from the Lord. And I'm convinced of it personally as well. So he says that. But, but, some people do look at the same thing and they consider that that thing does present a problem in their walk with God. I get it. He is saying, I know, he's an apostle. I know. He's not saying it's my opinion. He, I, it's my opinion versus their opinion. He says, I know from the Lord that this is true. However, there are still people that consider those same things will affect their walk with God. They'll still look at it and go, man, I can't do that. I shouldn't do that. And we went over the variety of reasons why that would be. Their conscience before God doesn't allow them to do that, to do those things. And, and then he says, that means to them, it is unclean. He doesn't say that means it is unclean. He says to them, it is unclean. So as far as they're concerned, it's wrong. You, you think it's okay. I think it's wrong. And, 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 it's, and he says, and that means if it's unclean to them, then they should avoid it. That they should avoid it. Now, why, why would that be? I'll, I'll give a little bit more. Uh, it, it's totally worth a, a, another couple of passages that we're going to side to in a minute. To talk, or right now, to talk about. Uh, just to add to that whole idea, why, are, why do we come down on different sides on these, on these uh, freedom issues? Uh, 1 Corinthians ver, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul said this. All things are lawful for me. And, and why is that? Because we're not under the law. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And, and so you put, the, put these two ideas together. The Apostle Paul said that, and he also said, I know there's nothing in unclean of itself. And so what he's saying is, yes, I understand it's completely, absolutely not unclean, but it can't, it, not everything still does you good. Not everything is still beneficial. Not everything is still a good idea for everyone. So what that means is, um, in, the, in, the, in the sense that he's saying, I'm convinced there's nothing unclean, but I, I know there's other people that aren't convinced. Let's take some of our examples. We'll, we'll take the big, the, probably the most controversial one, at least in my experience, and we mentioned it last week. You take the, the thing about alcohol. And, and you got people that are utterly and absolutely convinced from Scripture that, well, first of all, let's be clear, because I did this last time. Nobody's supposed to get drunk. No Christian is ever supposed to get drunk. That's clear. That's not the argument. Can, I get, can a Christian get drunk? No, you're not supposed to ever get drunk. It says, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. But so then the other issue is, okay, well then how about a beer here and there? Or how about a glass of wine? And that's the one that makes people fall down on this side and that side and people feel really strongly about it. And this is where we don't judge each other and look down on each other and fight over it. So, so what's the deal on that? As it relates to what we just read. Well, the deal is that all things are lawful. You, you can do that. But should everybody do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Everybody should not do that. There's probably a good, 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 good number of people should never, ever touch, ever, like ever. And, and we'll start with that. Because it can still do them harm. Why? Well... They're, maybe they came out of that. Maybe they're just prone to alcoholism. Clearly, lots of people are prone to alcoholism. And the only surefire way to know if you're not is to never drink. And if you have drank, you probably know if you're prone to it. And then you should know where you should stand on this issue. And then as it relates to other people around you, you might stumble them. They might, they might have come out of something and, they, and, they, and they're like, man, I just want to get away from that. I'm, finally, I'm glad I finally found the Lord in this whole thing and he's got a better life for me. And, you don't, and the first thing we said is, let's make a resolve. We're not going to stumble anybody. And then you have the issue of younger people and kids. 
Maybe they never have, but maybe they see you doing it and you're a Christian. Oh, that means it's okay. So we have to be very careful of all these things. We have to consider all of that. Not everyone should drink. Here's another example. We, we mentioned video games. Some people feel strongly one way. Some people don't feel strongly the other way. They just do it. That's what I think. <laughs> should, is that okay? I don't think everybody should play video games. Who shouldn't play video games? Listen. What, what was, let, let, the reason why I did alcohol first is because I think the principles there follow to the rest of them. What's the principle? What did he say in 1 Corinthians 6? I will not be brought under the power of any. If there's something that's going to bring me under its power, even though it's lawful, but it's going to bring me under its power, I shouldn't do that. You know when somebody's under the power of alcohol, they're drinking all the time, they're, you know, they're drunk. That, what about video games? If you can't play a video game without playing for six hours straight, I think you might be brought under its power. If you can't play a video game without every free moment you have playing a video game, I think you might be under its power. If you can't play a video game without every time you walk in the door, every time you have a free moment, you're either on your phone or your console or your whatever, I think you might have a problem. You probably shouldn't do it. You're under its power. Clearly you're under its power at that point. There, we could do other, other example. One more example. We can eat whatever we want. And I'm using that one because he does. He uses food. He talks about it a lot in this chapter. And as Christians, you can eat whatever you want. Lawfully. But should you? Should you eat whatever you want? I think there's people that absolutely should not eat whatever they want. Because at some point you can see clearly I'm under its power. Clearly. This thing has me more than I have it. Just like the alcohol, just like the video games, just like, you can do TV, movies. Should I watch, can a Christian watch television? Yes, a Christian can lawfully watch television. Should a Christian watch television? Not if every time you turn it on, you watch 28 episodes in a row. <laughs> Binging is not, that's like a joke term, like, but it's not a good thing if you feel like, you ha like that's all you do. None of these things, should, we shouldn't be brought under the power of any. Not, every, every, not everyone should do what anyone else can do. That's the idea. 1 Corinthians 10 says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. And you could go back, and edify means build up. And you could ask the same thing. You could say, what should, okay, I, I know legally you know, under grace, I can do things. And God's not going to kick me out of, a, he's not going to end his relationship with me. He's not going to be done with me. I can still walk closely. But is it going to build you up? Is, you have to ask, is drinking a beer going to build you up? Is playing video games going to build you up? Has it built you up? Ask yourself, have I ever been built up by doing this in my relationship with God? You know, have I ever been built up by going to the all you can eat? Have I ever been built up by watching a whole three seasons in a weekend? Has that ever built me up? Has that ever made me a stronger Christian? And, and that's what is emphasized here in this passage that, yes, there are freedoms, but we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And, and, and so now... He says all this, and the question might arise, yeah, isn't that what he determined in the first part? That yes, not it, you gotta, you know, you need to be convinced in your own mind, you gotta be clear between you and God, is it okay with me? Is it okay for me? Is it not okay? And he did, that is what he determined in the first part, but, but he's, he's, he's unfolding the, to help us understand more clearly what's this stumbling block all about. Verse 15 says, yet if your brother is grieved, because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. And so even though you can feel completely comfortable in your view, in your freedom, in, you know, I'm, I'm free to do this as a Christian on these side issues. If you're aware that somebody else doesn't have that freedom because they've either made it known to you, you know, they've just made it clear to you, 
or because you've seen where they came from. You're like, man, that's, I, I know, I know somebody who, uh, I, I'm like any other sinner. I, I have a propensity to complain. I'll complain as much as anyone else. But I, I know a couple people that if, if they start complaining, it, it doesn't end for hours. And it's, it's actually really, uh, and, I, and I'm close to, I'm, I, 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 I know this person well. And so I know that particularly when, I, it's never good to complain, but, but I also know that if I complain, I'm not, it's not unforgivable, God's gonna forgive me, my, my walk with God's not o- over. But I know if I start even a little bit with this person, I am going to stumble them. I'm going to make it. I'm not walking in love if I introduce that subject matter with this person. I'm not walking in love. And, and so he wants us to be aware of that kind of thing. It's possible that you, you have no problem with something. You don't have a problem at all. But they do. They just do. And, and, and it's not like you can't be a Christian. But, but doing this thing because you've, just because you feel free, knowing that there's people that don't feel as free, that is not loving. That is not loving. To go and insist and make, bring up your argument that, hey, I'm free in Christ and I can do this and I can do that. And to, to bring that up and completely ne- neglect. Yes, but what is it doing to other Christians around me? That's, that's not loving. It says you're no longer walking in love. At that moment, you're like, you're not being loving. What are you being? You're being selfish. And, he, and then he says, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Well, how would you do that? Because maybe, maybe your freedom is a compromise to them. And, 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 they're, and now they're feeling convicted. Or, or maybe it's, you know, when I came into the Christian life and I knew that this was like so, all this baggage I had involved around this area that now these people are just saying, you know, hey, have at it. The Lord will forgive you. And that's all they bring to it. That's all they, that's the only point they make about it. That, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem for them because it's like that person's going to know, oh no, I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. I, I know this is not good for me. I know the mess it made for me before. And, and I don't know what's going to happen if there's people around me that are like, you know, I'm just going to do that all I want. And, and so he says in verse 16, therefore, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Now, how do we not let our freedom, because that's what he saw, our freedom, be spoken of as evil? If we see it as true freedom. Now, again, Paul is clear. This is freedom I'm talking about. I'm not just talking opinions. I know from the Lord this is freedom. If, if we see it the way he did, and yet we act on it in front of people, around people in light of the fact that there's people that say, say it's not good. Here, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to call it evil. And, and so the question is, well, what's the solution? I say from the Bible, it's, it's fine. They say it's not good. How do I make them not call it evil? Yell at them every time they do? It's not evil. No, we can't do that. We already know the first part of the chapter. There's no arguing here. We're not fighting over these things. We're not debating. We're not doing that. That's not how it works. The solution isn't to say, well, that's their problem. It's not my fault they think that way. In fact, Paul says they're weak. Is that the solution? Well, you're just weak. And even though the Bible says that, it does. It, it's, 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 that's not the solution. The solution is the one who is free 
is to take them into account and consider it extremely important and sacrifice that freedom for the sake of that person. To be willing, if I need to be, regarding certain things, regarding certain people, regarding certain situations, to just abstain. To just say, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. I, I know that if I did, in itself, God would not have a problem with me. But because of this brother, and the issues that are, arise because of this brother, not for my conscience, because my conscience is clear, but for their conscience, and for their walk, and for their, you know, peace, to just go, I, I don't need to do that. I'm not going to do it then. I'm not going to do it. Now, why? Why should we do that? Why? why? Why can't they just get over it? Why can't they just be less uptight? Why can't they just be less legalistic? Why can't they just get over these things? It says, he says why in verse 17? Because the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Give up the debate. Give up the insistence that, they're, that I'm going to do whatever I want. That's their problem if they don't like it. Give that up. Why? Because that's not what the kingdom of God is about. I, I bet if we went around this room and had everybody who's saved share their testimony, that nobody came up and witnessed to you and said, hey, would you like to be a Christian? Sure, what do I have to do? And you start telling them about Jesus, and, and then they say, well, can I still do this? And can I still do that? And can I still do this? Because I really like to do this. I'll bet nobody did that and went, you can, technically, there's, we're free in Christ. Well, I really like to do this, and I'm not stopping no matter what. But if you say I can, then I'll become a Christian. Anybody ever, like, was that your testimony of how you came to the Lord? No. You're like, my sins can be forgiven? God loves me? I can have eternal life? I'm in. I'm in. I need it. I, that's what I need. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. What can you eat? What can't you eat? What can you drink? What can't you drink? That's not what the kingdom of God is about. That's not what drew us to the kingdom of God. That's not why anybody comes into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, that's so much greater than can I eat this or eat that or not eat this or drink that. It's so much greater than that. It's so much higher. It's so much more beautiful. It's so much more powerful. There's so much, it's so much better than can I do this thing that I really like to do that some people don't like when I do it. it and he says righteousness. And here's the thing about righteousness. Be careful at this point. Be careful not to sneak your side issue at this point, even though we've been talking about it all along, to sneak your side issue in and call that a righteousness issue. We know because we studied the first part of Romans that our righteousness is not by works. It's not by our adherence to restrictions of certain things or freedoms of certain things. How are we righteous? Through faith in Jesus. That, that's how we become righteous. He imputes the righteousness of Jesus to us. And that's what the gospel's about. That's what the kingdom of God's about. It's not about you're righteous because you didn't eat that. It's not you're righteous because you don't drink that. It's righteousness in Jesus. And, and then, and through faith. And then he says, peace. The kingdom of God's not about eating and drinking. It's about peace. It's about having peace with God. We're justified by faith and we have peace with God. He's not fighting with us. We're not fighting with him. We're not enemies of his. We're not under his wrath. We have peace with God. He's not against us anymore. And because we have peace with God, we get to enjoy the peace of God. Jesus said, my peace I give you. 
That's what the kingdom of God's about. And then he also says joy in the Holy Spirit. I'll bet many of us were extremely miserable before we came to Christ. I know I was. I, I still, in some of us, we can still get miserable when we lose sight, right? When we get our eyes off the, wrong, off the right thing, we forget all that Jesus is for us and all that he does for us and all that he provides. But that's what the kingdom of God's about. It's about joy, joy in the Holy Spirit. All that it said that, you know, walking in the spirit in Romans chapter eight. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's not, can I eat? Can I drink? If you, and he says, if you serve Christ that way, you're going to be acceptable to God. Not acceptable in the sense of being saved, but God's going to be like, you're good. You're on the right track. You're on the, you have the right mindset. You got, you're getting it. Acceptable God and a blessing to people. You're going to be a blessing to people. Because listen, if not, if the kingdom of God and the fo our focus on the kingdom of God is not righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, and it's more, you can't do that. Yes, I can. No, you can't. If it's all that, what a disaster. Why? Because people need to be saved. They don't need to find rules. That everybody's got rules. They, there's all those rules. They're all out there. We don't need all that. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to anyone who believes. They don't need a, a bunch of, the, look, somebody comes in for whatever reason, or you talk to them as a Christian, or they come into a church, whatever brought them here, and, they, and, they're, and they're like a person who's like ready, like, I know I need something, I know I need God, whatever that means, they just know. They don't need to come in and be told a bunch of rules. They don't need to come in and see a bunch of Christians arguing about what Christians can or can't do. What a disaster, what a disaster. They need more than anything else is to know Jesus, righteousness, peace, and joy through him. That's why if we do that and make that the focus, and, and then we're acceptable by God and we're approved by people because they're going to come in and they're going to go, that's what I need. And now if they don't want that, there's nothing we can do about that. But when they're ready, if we try to give them anything other than that, Oh man, we're missing it bad. We're blowing it big. He says, verse 19, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So what, do we, so what we do knowing what the kingdom of God about is this. He says we have something to pursue. And when he says pursue, the idea there is here's our goal. You pursue a goal, right? That's what you do. Here's our goal. This is what our goal is. Our goal is not how much of my Christian freedom can I exercise and see how many people get triggered by it and upset and how many other Christians get all fired up and, you know, whatever. That's not our goal. Our goal is that we should be looking to figure out how to make for peace and how to edify or build other people up. So how do you make for peace? Well, if you know that there's people on different sides of the issue, that's the whole first part that he talked about. Don't be, don't be all being controversial, fighting with people over these side issues. It means if you have to, forego your freedom. Okay, you're free. Give it up. And then, and then to edify, again, are, are, is every one of your freedoms and the way that you pr practice it and the way that you do it really going to build everybody up? Is it going to build others up? Usually, probably always, if I thought long enough about it, our freedoms for sure are not going to build everybody up. But you're not going to hurt anybody if you abstain from it, usually. You're not going to hurt anybody. The only, person, the only person you might hurt is your own, you know, selfish wants. And, and what does this all mean? Remember the very beginning of the practical section? Because we're still in the practical section of Romans. The very first part, Romans chapter 12, at the beginning there, live your life, be, you know, be a living sacrifice. Sacrifice means giving up, right? It means give something up. So we should be okay with going, 
I'm not always free to do what I feel like I'm free to do. Not because of me and God. I'm clear. My conscience is clear. But because of others around me. <clears throat> the question shouldn't be, can I or can't I? We should be clear on that. You can't. And if you're not, it's okay. But it should be, what does this do to others around me? And it should be, what could it do to even one around me? And, and so, does it make part of the body of Christ stumble? Does it make them uh, grieved? Does it make them argue? Verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure. And he, he keeps repeating himself, but he wants to make further points. All things are indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He says that all things indeed are pure again. Because he wants, again, abundantly clear, that's not the issue. That's not the problem. That's not what we're talking about. That's not why you can or can't. It's evil if you do it in a way that hurts or harms, offends, stumbles, or weakens somebody else. That's when it's sin. And so that's why you need to make, we need to make considerations to our freedoms. Our considerations on whether I or can't, I or I can or can't personally, you should work through those. If you haven't worked through those things, you should. But that's not where you stop. Then you have to, then you have to always consider and never stop considering who am I around? What am I doing? What's it possibly doing with them? And and it says if I'm doing any of those things in a way that stumbles, offends, or makes them weak, it says that's evil. That, that's where the evil comes in. Not can I or can't I as a Christian, but what happens with them. Now, I, I heard somebody once, because I had a discussion about this one time with somebody, and they said, well, I never have stumbled anybody, so I don't know why people are always saying that. And, and here's what I would say to that. How do you know? How could you possibly know that? How could you possibly know that? Some people are bold enough to speak up, but a lot of people are just going to walk, they're going to leave that, that thing and they're just going to be like, it's going to be in there now. And it's going to be rolling around. Some, some bad seed was planted. And how would you know that? How would you know that? It, at the very least, ask somebody, hey, is, are you going to be offended if I do this? Or is this okay? What do you think of this? At the very least, do that. Or just go, you know what? It's probably safer just in this setting to just not do this. I just better. Why take the risk? And, and, and so he says, and again, why isn't that their problem? Why, why is that my problem? So that's a decent question, isn't it? Why is that my problem? They're the ones, at the end of the passage, he calls them scruples, which is a word that means it's their weakness. I'm not the one that's weak. They're weak. Why is that my problem? Shouldn't the stronger person care for the weaker person? Shouldn't, isn't that usually how it works? Isn't that honorable? Isn't that the right way to do it? Don't parents care for their kids because the kids are weaker? <laughs> right? You have, I have sons and daughters. And I can be, I will be rougher with my sons than my daughters. And I could say, I could say, well, why can't she just be tougher? I could do that. That's stupid. That's, that's not loving. It's not right. And, and it's like that. There, there are people that are not in the same place as you. Verse 20 to 21 tells us that it's not about whether you can do it or not. That's not the biggest issue. It's about the offending, stumbling, weakening. And when we argue about it, if we're just going to argue about these things, 
we're probably already in a bad place. We're probably already like leaning towards the, I'm not going to be loving on this issue. I'm just going to do what I, I get to do because I get to. And so he says, Let, yeah, let's get up, let's give up the fighting, but let's also give up insisting that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. And let's focus on what would be the biggest benefit to building other people up. Verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Nobody's against you having faith that you're free to do certain things. Between you and God, be free. And he even says, happy is he who does not condemn himself, condemn himself in what he approves. You're, you're probably a little bit... When you're free, in, when you have these Christian liberties, you probably are more at ease about it than the, the people that aren't, that don't have the freedoms. And he said, that's good. Be happy. Good for you. Great. And he's not being sarcastic. He's just saying, yeah, that's great. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. If a person has this conviction, this is not for me, I shouldn't do this, and, and, then, and then because of your freedom they go ahead and eat, they're going to feel condemned. And it doesn't mean that condemnation is legitimate or valid, but they're going to feel it. They are. And do you want that? We don't want them to feel it. You know, again, go back to the idea of kids. If my kids... I have a, a, a pretty high tolerance of pain, especially on my hands, because I've been doing construction so long, and, and heat, I'm really okay with heat usually. But does that mean I should expect my kids to have that same tolerance and, and, that, kind of, and that kind of thing? No, I should just know. If, if, if they do what I do, it's going to feel a lot differently than when I do it. And, and so... Uh, happy is he who's not condemned in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. He doesn't have the faith to, to do, express that freedom the way that you do. And, and then whatever is not done in faith is sin. So we shouldn't expect them to do it if they don't have faith to do it. So if somebody has this restriction on their life because of their conscience, they're, they don't have enough faith to say, I'm free to do this and I'm going to do this. Our, those with freedom have the danger of influencing them to go, ah, just go ahead. Whether you say that or it's just thought of because you're doing it in their presence or in their knowledge. And they don't have the faith and then they go and do it. Whatever's not done in faith is sin. And you don't want to influence somebody to act outside of faith. Verse 15 says, and this is the summary. This is like the conclusion of the whole matter. He says, we then who are strong. And again, he, he said it earlier on. The strong is the one that feels the, that they have the freedom. We who are strong ought to bear with the scruples or the weaknesses. That's what that word means. Of the weak and not to please ourselves. It's not about what can I do, what can I please ourselves. It's about what do I do around those who are weaker than me or might be weaker than me. We ought to bear with them. We ought to cater to them. We ought to sacrifice to the one, for, the one, for the one who's weaker. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. It's not for it's not about eating and drinking. It's righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. What's, what's better for them? Not what, what, what do I like better, but what's better for them, for their well-being? And, and that's, the, that's the, the last word he says. And, and just in case anyone's left with, that's not fair, he tells us, verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. We're just following the example of Jesus by doing this. We're just following. Jesus was in the form of God, but he didn't, he didn't figure, he didn't say, I gotta, I gotta hold on to my rights as God. He's God. But what did he do? He stooped down for the weak, us. While we were still without strength, he came. And he, to, to die for us. 
He made a sacrifice. Really, the greatest issue in this freedom, you know, Christian liberties, I can or I can't debate, it's so much more than can I or can't I, it's, it's what is most Christ-like here? What is most Christ-like? And, and what is most Christ-like is he gave up everything, anything he needed to for our benefit. And, and so, and, and the one who has the liberty is called to be the one that gives up more freedoms. The one that feels in their conscience, I'm okay to do this as a Christian, is also the one who is called to be more self-denying, more self-denying for the benefit of those others. That's what Jesus did for us. We're not doing anything different than what he did. He died while we were still without strength. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's what he did. And so this issue is all about just what, where do I fall as it relates to that? If our mindset on Christian liberties and Christian restrictions doesn't include that, we're not going to have the right conclusion. Everything points back to Jesus. And if you're here this morning and, and, or you're listening over the air or online and, and, and Christians have ever given you this idea that being a Christian is all about what you're allowed to do and not do, let us clear that up for you and let you know what the kingdom of God is about, what it is, what it is to be a Christian, what Jesus is all about, is that we're sinners and we need salvation. We need to be saved. We're not right with God by ourselves. We're separated from him because we're sinners. And so God sent his son because he loves you as a sinner to die on the cross, to take the punishment that you deserve for your sins, to take your place so that you can be right with God and all your sins can be forgiven and when you die you'll go to heaven forever and even right now if you receive him by believing in him he'll come into your life and he'll never leave he'll make you a child of God he'll put you in the family of God he'll give you the Holy Spirit that's what it's about it's not about can't, what you can and can't do it's about knowing Jesus as Lord and if you don't know him yet, you can know him today. Just tell him, tell him, invite him into your life. Confess your sin. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. And I want to live differently now. And I want you to come into my life. And I choose to believe that Jesus died for me and rose. And I, and I choose to, to submit to him as Lord of my life. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And that's how you become a Christian. You can do that right now. Just tell them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we do have so much freedom. That we're not going to do something that's going to make you go, oh, you're out now. As long as we trust you, that's not going to happen. And so, Lord, help us to be free but to be loving help us to be free but to consider others and building up your kingdom and doing what's best for peace and if you've spoken to us or convicted us as it relates to some freedom that we haven't been loving in regards to then we pray that we would just turn from that but thank you that we're free we thank you that we're free we're not going to be condemned we love you for it, and we praise you for it. And Lord, we pray for anyone that wants to receive you, that they'd tell you right now that they'd say, Lord, come into my life. And Lord, we love you, and we pray you, praise you, and we just pray you'll bless uh, the rest of our day. And Lord, we pray right now for the food that we're going to eat. Bless it to our bodies and the fellowship and the time together. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, and we'll finish up with one last song.